Welcome to The Real News. I'm Eddie Conway from Baltimore. We are discussing the for-profit video visitation that is quietly sweeping the nation's prisons and jails. Our guest is Bernadette Rabbi. Bernadette Rabbi joined the Prison Policy Initiative as a policy communication associate in August of 2014. A graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, she has previously worked with National Council on Crime and Delinquency, Voice of the Ex-Offender, and Californians United for a Responsible Budget. Bernadette led the research on the vis video visitation industry and co-authored the first comprehensive national survey of the industry, Screening Out Family Time the for-profit video visitation industry in prisons and jails. Thank you for joining me, Bernadette. Thanks for having me. Okay, what I'm, I'm curious about, what are some of the positive impacts of uh, video visitations and, and when should it be applied? Well, I think the most obvious benefit of video visitation is the ability for family members and friends who are living far away from a correctional facility to be able to visit um, with their incarcerated loved one. So, you know, if someone is in a different state than um, their incarcerated loved one, video visitation offers a much more affordable alternative. Okay, well, what are the drawbacks then? I mean, this visitation sounds like it's, uh, it's something positive. Right, um, so what we've seen is that instead of video visitation being implemented as a supplemental option for families to stay in touch with their incarcerated loved ones, video visitation is being implemented to replace traditional visits. Um, so that is really harmful and there are a lot of disadvantages to this practice. So um, for example, Families do not feel as if these video visits are the same as being in person with um, their incarcerated loved one. Even if that means there is that glass barrier, they still feel as if with that glass barrier, um, they're having a more personal visit. They can still put their hand up to the glass and their incarcerated loved one can put his or her hand up to that same piece of glass or they can see that person's them breathing, different things like that that are just lost with these glitchy video visitation systems. And then there are other things. Um, in addition to the high price, uh, these video visits can cost up to $1.50 per minute. Um, they're also very glitchy, so there are significant audio delays, um, pixelated images. Those types of things make video visits really a not a great alternative and definitely not a good replacement for through the glass in-person visits. Well, where are these uh, visitations uh, conducted at um, and are they private? That's another problem with these video visits. Um, so the main argument that jails and sheriffs give for moving to video visitation systems is that they will be able to save money um, because they will no longer need to bring the incarcerated people from their cells to a central visitation room. But um, what this means is that these video uh, visitation terminals are located in two places, usually, um, for the visitors, so the family members who come to the jail. They're located in a room um, very similar to a visitation room uh, with regular traditional visits. And then for the incarcerated person, they're located in the pods of cells. So that creates a privacy problem because what happens is when a family member is visiting an incarcerated person through the video visitation system, they can see other people in the background. Um, it's very distracting and it does not feel private or personal at all. How does this impact uh, the visits with lawyers when uh, a prisoner and a lawyer have a, a video visitation? Is, is, is this going to jeopardize their uh, confidentiality? Yeah, so we've seen some complaints from lawyers in different places throughout the country. Um, 
there were some complaints in Travis County in Texas. Uh, what happened there is, so these video visits are recorded. Um, although most of the contracts say that when they're attorney-client conversations that they should be marked as privileged and not recorded. Uh, but what happened in Travis is it was found that um, some of the visits that were supposed to be privileged were recorded and some lawyers have um, filed a suit because they believe that those recordings were turned over to the district attorney's office. Uh, so that's one problem. In New Orleans, in Louisiana, we've seen something else where the lawyers have had a very difficult time trying to have um, build a relationship with their clients using these frustrating video visitation systems. They talk about trying to have a visit and the incarcerated person getting up in the middle of the visit because they are simply too frustrated to continue using these glitchy video visitation systems. What about the, the people that are most impacted by this in whole incarceration thing? Most people are unfortunately uh, uh, Afro-Americans, uh, they are from uh, the inner city, and prisons are uh, sometimes hundreds of miles away. Is this video visitation accessible to their family members? Absolutely not. Uh, so that's one of the biggest problems is these video visitation systems are not affordable. Um, so what we've seen is the reason that jails um, and private companies have moved towards, towards these video visitation systems and banned in-person visits is to stimulate the demand for these remote video chats. Because with video visitation, there are two options. You can have a remote video chat that you pay for, um, or you can go to the facility and you can have a few free visits per week. So for example, many jails will offer two free visits from the jail lobby a week. Um, so what ends up happening is because these families do not, cannot afford to pay a dollar per minute, which is the typical price, dollar per minute for a video visit from home, they end up going to the facility anyway for their free video visit. So they don't save any time, they don't save any expenses because they're still going to the facility. And instead of having an in-person visit, they go to the facility and have to have a visit with a computer screen. So, so uh, this, is this happening in prisons and in jails? And if so, what's the difference between how how it's, you know, working in the jail system and how it's working in the prison system. Right. So what we've seen is that in the state prison context, video visitation is being used to supplement. So it's used as an additional option for families um, who would like to use the service and would like to pay to use the remote video visits. In the jail context, it's very different. So we found that 74% of the jails um, that we collected contracts for banned in-person visits once they implemented video visits. So for jails, they're really s replacing the traditional visits with these video visits. Well, you know, uh, it's my understanding that people that are in jails in most cases are, are, are in jail for misdemeanors, uh, uh, very rarely are they in the jail system for felonies. They are either waiting trial and they're basically very close to their, the communities in which they were incarcerated from. Uh, and uh, so obviously those facilities are more available and closer for family members to reach. What, right. At the same time, the prisons are in some cases 75 or 100 miles away why isn't it used in the prison system more than in the jail system? Is this like an economic thing? Yeah, so we don't know for sure why, um, why jails are implementing video visitation much more than state prisons. Um, you know, one idea is that jails are more decentralized and run by 
elected sheriffs um, versus if a state prison wants to adopt video visitation, it's likely that they would need to talk to the Department of Corrections and that process just might take longer. Um, so it's possible that jails have been able to adopt video visitation more quickly. Um, but what you talked about is really important because when we're talking about county jails, we're talking about the huge um, portion of the population that hasn't even been convicted yet. Um, and we're also talking about people who likely aren't too far from their families. So the families actually have a greater opportunity to visit. Um, so we were actually surprised to find in our research that state prisons aren't using video visitation more and that it's actually much more prevalent in this county jail context. You know, uh, and I guess one, one of the other things that, that has struck me as I'm looking at this, and uh, I think you probably covered it in the report, is the, the isolation from, uh, especially in uh, rural areas, it's, it's, it's almost impossible sometimes to go to places like uh, Cumberland, Maryland, which uh, from the uh, major urban centers is, is anywhere from 150 miles to 200 mile trip in a, or 300 mile round trip. The isolation on the one hand uh, causes family members not to be able to get there uh, and to visit people. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, not having these video visits available uh, it's it's actually it hampers family members from at least having that kind of contact. Uh, what can be done on the state level to change that? Because in some cases those visits are important and valuable, and in other cases they stop human contact. But I think in the in the far outlined regions and prisons, it's a necessity. Uh, for economics and, and other reasons for people to be able to have that? Yeah, so I think one thing um, is that some changes need to be made with the current systems um, before they're really expanded. So, uh, for example, I talked to someone who's incarcerated in Washington State at a prison where they do have video visitation, and the experience was pretty awful. Um, there were just major audio delays, and it was very grainy, uh, very glitchy. And I asked him, you know, whether people were using the video visitation systems. And what he told me was that no, no one really uses them um, because people have very negative experiences, um, and and that can be very disappointing, especially when you, you know, you're paying for that remote video visit. Um, and, you know, in a different state prison in Washington, we talked to an incarcerated person who's there, and he told us, um, we scheduled a visit with him and found out that their terminals haven't been working for months. Um, so, you know, we were sitting here waiting for the visit to start, and it just never starts. Um, and he's sitting there, too. Um, so that's one of the problems, is that these systems aren't made to be user friendly and they definitely, um, these companies aren't thinking about what's going to benefit incarcerated people and their families. There are a lot of things that can be changed with these video systems to make them, you know, an actual benefit. And like one place would be even the cost. Um, JPay, which is the main provider of video visitation in state prisons, uh, actually charges a much more reasonable price for video visits than what's usually charged in the county jails. They usually charge around 30 cents per minute. Um, but we've talked to people who say even that is too much. Um, so we definitely believe, you know, the main benefit of video visitation would be in state prisons, but we also would really like some of these changes to be made. Uh, we would like these companies to improve their products. Please join us for our next part of our discussion on the video visitation.